Thanks, Carrie, for having me and uh, keeping me hopping so I don't get to get into too much trouble with my first visit to Oklahoma. And I'm really excited to be here and learn about your state and about the good work you're doing here. Um, and about sharing the work that I've been doing that's been really transformative to me um, over the last several years, which have been challenging years. So um, the activist art that um, I've been engaging in in Milwaukee and beyond has been sort of a light bulb for me, and I'm really excited to share it with you. Um, so before I begin, I want to be sure to acknowledge that the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., even our most well events and hallowed institutions take place and are situated on land not stolen from indigenous people. Um, and this is especially important this week when it's, it's a time when people are celebrating Columbus Day. Humans, the cause of and solution to all life's problems. This is actually a paraphrase of Homer Simpson, who said that about beer. <laughs> uh, my colleague and uh, friend and colleague, printmaker Cynthia, Cynthia Greenwich Langwa, was asked a question about the future of the planet following an artist talk she gave that went something like this Student, do you think the planet can be saved? Cynthia, ah, the earth will be fine. It will adapt, but it will do so in ways that will make human habitation impossible. Her answer was very matter of fact, but it really rocked the audience. And to me, it was um, strangely comforting. I'm like, yeah, that's right, there it's going to be OK. It's, it's survived things in the past. Um, we're just making it uh, to be a place that is uninhabitable by humans. Um, and it reminded me of this beautiful movie by Lar Lars von Trier. I don't know if you've seen it, Melancholia. It's this really interesting story of um, Kirsten Dunst plays the main character who's um, has you know pretty severe depression. She's supposed to be getting married, and at the beginning of the movie, she's she's just sort of almost immobile um, with depression. And then as the movie unfolds, this story of this planet that's going to come and collide with the Earth happens, and um, the planet is called Melancholia. And she's strangely strangely buoyed by this idea that um, the, the Earth's going to be ending. Um, well, every other character in the place is freaking out. So I sort of sort of just tangentially reminded of that. Um, that story, um, and I know it's it's you know it's a kind of a more way to start to the top, but I but I do think that it's comforting in some ways to know that the earth is going to hang on, and I feel sort of that as a species, we don't deserve what we have, and we don't take care of it as well as we should, and so we need to change that to make things um, turn things around. So. Um, a couple of questions come to mind. What can art and art education do in these perilous times? And how might artistic activism become a movement building project that makes a difference? In this talk, I will focus on these questions and offer examples of the work of activist scholars who engage in art making that seeks to imagine and bring into being a more just world. This work is situated within a critical framework that helps frame imaginative hopes and dreams about the activist art and art education we can do in these precarious times. We can make art that changes the world. Today I share with you what I'm learning to do with communities of, within communities of caring humans. Sustained engagement with art, activism, and activists has given me opportunities to formulate guiding questions about the aims of such artistic interventions and to begin to consolidate strategies that can be repl replicated anywhere by anyone interested Employing art to join the global uprising for justice. This morning we had a, a much stenciling workshop with OSU students that was really um, an exciting event, and that you know it's an example of the ways that I want the work that I come and talk to people about to carry on into the future. So I'm hoping that I caught a few techniques this morning. Students made incredible work. That if we have time, I'll show you some of the images from that. Um, and so again, with the work that I wanted to share with you today, I hope that you take this, this information and run with it and make it. Um, work for you in your own places. So Yates McKee, participant, chronicler, and scholar of the Occupy Movement, argues for an activist stance for researchers, asserting that academic research by itself is largely confined to a small expert audience regardless of its radical aspirations. I agree with this stance and think that the same can be said for a lot of artistic research. I invite you to join in the work of expanding the reach of art and education with a sincere desire not only to dismantle oppressive structures, but also engage with community members to imagine a better, more just future. 
For me, Adrienne Marie Brown's concept of emergent strategy, which draws upon the wisdom of the natural world and the power of visionary fiction to inform movement building, is central to how I'm framing this work. There are models in the natural world that we can humbly learn from. And while at the same time, we must harness the power of human imagination to create new ways of being in the world. Jordan and Anne McKee's conceptualization of a movement imaginary that grows out of collective artistic activist work helped frame my understanding of the work we've been doing. We're in a time now when increasing repression and injustice are being met by movements for social justice that are exploding and expanding making new connections that hopefully will be enough, maybe even more than enough, to save ourselves. As a general rule, Americans don't have a handle on the history of resistance and progressive politics. This is, of course, no accident. The history of the US is the history of revolution, but the only revolution most folks know about is the sanitized textbook version of the Revolutionary War, or what I like to now call the first American Revolution. Albertson's graphic text, A People's History of American Empire, reveals a cycle. Oppression by elites, beginning with colonial genocide and forced removal of Native Americans and enslavement of people from Africa, which are the foundation of this country and its capitalist system. Moving into growing unrest, followed by gains by and for working people, and then a backlash by elites. That this happens is as predictable as clockwork. With each cycle, the rich and powerful hone their tactics, and the work of or organizing has to be created anew. We live in a time, again, of uprising, of resistance, and of movement building. As Adrian Murray Brown says, here you are in the cycle between the past and the future, choosing to spend your miraculous time in the exploration of how humans, especially those, those seeking to grow liberation, can learn from the world around us how best to collaborate how to shape change. Brown had asked the idea of shaping change from Octavia Butler's vision of shaping God. Oh, sorry. Leave it. <laughs> My mistake. I made out of context. <laughs> <laughs> um, a set of ideas the brilliant visionary fiction writer introduced in her Earth Seeds verses in the Parable of the Sower. In that book, which is set in a dystopian near future, you know, next week, the protagonist, an African-American teenage girl named Lauren Olamina, is an empath and daughter of a minister. Before she was forced to go on the run, Lauren had already begun to question the ways of society operated and to envision a different way of being in the world through a new religion called Earth Seeds, in which humans have the capacity and the duty to shape God in their own destiny. In this way, Octavia Butler used the power of literature to imagine the world otherwise. In emergent strategy, Adrian Marie Brown builds upon the power of that story and links it to, the, to movement building projects of today on the processes of the natural world, from which we can learn about uh, much about collaboration, survival, and beauty. I think of this often as I engage in the work I will focus on in this presentation. She calls upon us to shape change. From the Wisconsin uprising in the Arab Spring to Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, Fight for 15, March for Climate Jobs and Justice, March for Our Lives, Women's March, and Me Too movement, people are mobilizing against the many evils that are occurring before us, including the state incarceration of tiny children. Once again, the people are waking up and taking it to the streets. And for the first time that I can remember, they are linking all of these in issues in intersectional ways and leveraging the power of art to shape change. We know that unless we radically rethink our future, unless we shape change, the cycle of oppression and uprising will continue. Brown quotes Mary Cooks of Southerners on New Ground, which she urges us to be transformed in the service of the work. In the work that I'm about to share with you, I'm experiencing that transformation myself, as I mentioned, and it's largely responsible for keeping me from sinking into despair. This is what the community orga organizing group movement generation calls resilience-based organizing. I just love that idea of resilience-based organizing. That we organize against things, but we also organize for things. And we band together to create communities that forge a new way of being in the world. And we've been doing that through art in Milwaukee, and I invite you to join me on that. Um, OK. So in the beginning, um, David Stalnett, who you see on the slide on the right, um, is uh, an activist who's been involved in 
a lot of mass mobilizations from the Paris Climate March, um, the battle in Seattle, all kinds of like the big movements that happen, um, and protests, and he is kind of the center of the art making part of that that happened. And he came, my uh, colleague Nicholas Lampert came, uh, I invited him, David Solomon, to come and do a talk. We have an Artist Now lecture series, and um, he invited Solomon to come, and he's like, I'm not going to come unless we get to do an art film. And like, let's do it. So we um, we rented a space above Company Brewing, which um, Carrie knows about. Um, it's in my neighborhood, which is called River West, and um, and uh, it's kind of fitting. We, Milwaukee's called Brew City, you know, beer is a big Milwaukee name is around that. So that we started at above a brewery is, is kind of appropriate. Um, and um, Sonic came and taught us how to do the work. And we're going to be doing a little bit of that work tomorrow at the Oklahoma Art Education Association Convention. Um, uh, doing a mini art build tomorrow. And I'll be sharing uh, the kinds of things that we do in our book movement. Um, Nicholas's blog, which I was going to, I think I'm going to kind of skip since you're, I, was, I have some links in here. And I could share the presentation with Carrie, and she could share with folks that are interested so you can kind of dig in a little bit deeper. But, We'll just keep it simple, I think, today. Um, so Nicholas Lampert um, is part of the Just Seed Art Artist Collective. If you're not familiar with Just Seed, it's an amazing collective of artists who um, are primarily printmakers. And there's also blogs on there that can get information about a lot of different movement building. And Nicholas wrote about um, this uh, first art build on there. There's a really nice article. That first art build was a partnership with a coalition of groups from Stop the Oil Trains, um, an environmental activist group, and sort of the old school lefty um, in our bay had gray hair um, folks that show up. Uh, uh, and also a group called Coalition for Justice, which is um, was formed by the family of Dante Hamilton, who was an African American man in Milwaukee who had um, mental health challenges and was shot and killed um, by a police officer. Uh, for sleeping on a park bench in front of the Starbucks. Um, to, let's see, you know, to Stay of Frontera, which is a group I'll talk a lot about. Um, they are uh, an incredible immigrant right, rights group in Milwaukee, based in Milwaukee, and um, it's kind of moving out from there now. Um, and those are the major, oh, yeah, the Youth Empowered the Stru Struggle is this really cool um, youth led organizing group that was there on that first day. Nicholas put out a call to local artists to create designs ahead of time. So we were able to hit the ground running. Um, let's see. We now, so as I mentioned, the first one was in this building. The first several art builds were in this building. And now I finally um, talked to our dean into giving us a sort of semi-dedicated space. Uh, it gets used for lots of other things, but we're allowed to do art builds um, in this kind of massive studio building that's on our campus, and it's really exciting. So what is an art build? An art build is a community art making event that happens in the service for movements for social justice. Okay. Um, yeah, we won't try it. So the, the, there's a video down the bottom that is um, it's really wonderful. There's little kids that are running prints. So we always have one of the things we have is a print factory. And um, people are pulling screen prints and you have runners. And, and this is a beautiful um, short video of these little girls grabbing the prints and running them all over the building, laying them down to dry. It's really, really nice. Um, so an art build is both a physical space for community building and the social and psychological space for movement building. Here's how it works. Typically, a community partner reaches out to one of us because they're planning some sort of action. We reach out to a group we call, we, um, that we built after the first art build called Bosa Sailor. De Los Artistas that Carrie mentioned. It's kind of a loose network of artists who are interested in working for social justice. And we have a closed Facebook group. Um, and community members know they can go on there and ask. Um, they can ask us to design for a, a, an activity. And then we can share uh, ideas with each other and that sort of thing on Facebook. Um, and so we put the call out for designs. Um, and then, OK. Um, so here's a little kind of a um, run through on my design process. When I started this work, I hadn't really made artwork, um, like designing type artwork in a long time. 
So it's kind of reignited that in, in me. Um, one of the ways that I do the, the um, visual research is look for contemporary images that I can pull into um, new designs that will read, um, at, you know, large scale banners and screen prints and things like that. So um, in this project, you know, um, I use that image of a young 17 year old girl who's standing in front of the White House um, and turned it into this banner that was for part of a March for Our Lives uh, uh, action in Milwaukee. And this was a really cool our bill because it was initiated by young people. The teenagers, you know, contacted us and there were a lot of the designs that we used for this one were generated by kids. Um, but I was able to do this project. Um, and you can go to the next one. Um, another process that I use is to look at historical imagery. And so in this case, I was designing for an art build with the National Education Association, which I'll show you um, more images of that soon. Um, but they had um, contacted us to do 15 parachute banners at their conference on racial and social justice that happened before their big convening in the summer in Minneapolis. These parachute banners are 25 foot um, play parachutes that you can order online. And they just come these white, sort of big, huge canvases. And we designed the images to go on that. And then we traced them out beforehand um, and then went to Minneapolis with the trace designs. And then volunteers just came and it was this massive space um, at the Minneapolis Convention Center. And we were able to have like four or five of the giant parachutes out at a time. And it was just incredible. So in this case, I used, um, I looked at images from Emory Douglas who um, you probably know was a designer um, and a cultural um, minister for the Black Panther Party. And so I took part of, partly his image, and then I had also already done a um, linoleum cut that was based on archival images from the lesbian Avengers um, that were active in the 90s. And, um, and then for the linoleum print, I compromised that to put Pussy Riot and the Women's March imagery in there too. So I combined the two of those then into, um, I think the next one will be, yep. So there's a parachute um, banner. So I combine those two images to come up with this powerful image. And that, that one I'll show more later, but it was pretty cool. They put it up and people were going and taking selfies and, um, and it, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, so, then we sh so then after we make the design, we have to share it with the community group and they get final say on messaging and um, the design work and things like that. Um, and final say on what we do. Next one. Um, okay, so there was gonna be another video here that we won't do. Um, so once we get the design work going, we schedule a bill, put the word out by, by, by social media, simultaneous with, with our community partners. So all the artists put word out, Community partner puts word out so it gets um, you know the most coverage sort of by all manner of means, um, and then we transform a space by covering everything with tarps, organizing workstations, in, including banner tracing and painting areas. So you have a room, a space where it's dark, so you can project, project images, and you have a team usually of people tracing out the banner designs, and then they run it over to the painting areas, and people. Um, are you know, working on painting, and it's, it's really great because it's, it gives people a way to um, to be art, you know, be artistic, but it's kind of like coloring books, so you don't have to, you don't have to design anything. And people, you know, it's amazing. I'll talk about this more when I when I talk about what art builds do. But it is amazing how many, how awesome people will work a fourteen hour day and then thank you for giving them the opportunity to do that. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, and then we work from up to one, one to up to eight days um, to create art for an action. So here's an example of um, tracing a banner. This is one of our, mo our most crazy banners we have done. We've made this one twice, actually. It's made from a woodcut by our colleague Raul Deal, who carried on as well. Um, and the image itself is bigger, so we just you know kind of zoomed in on this one. Um, Osas de la Frontera asked for Banners to be designed for a march against a new law they were trying to pass to make um, police ICE agents. And so um, this, this design was made. And then, um, you know, you have to 
have a space that's big enough to put a banner up this size to trace it. Um, most of the banners are it's not that big, you know, it's maybe like 10 foot wide or something like the one you saw from the March Shore Line. But we have done now a lot of these parish parachute banners as well. And then, um, and then you just get a crew of people painting. Um, and that one was nuts because when you get, when you're like trying to paint that image, you're right on top of it and it's traced, you know, kind of loosely traced. To, to kind of keep in your mind which part is supposed to be painted and which part doesn't, it's, it's really tricky. Um, so we do a lot of like climbing up on a ladder and looking, and everybody has printouts of the of the image, and you're you know going back and forth. Um, next one. Um, we always have what we call a print factory set up. I mentioned that when I said the little girls were running the prints is always um, almost always screen printing. This is Paul Keelan on the right, um, working with a couple of little community members. Um, he is an incredible artist, and this guy, sorry, this guy can work. I've never seen anybody be able to screen print for as long as he can. Like, he literally, we have you know, 14 hour days and he's just pulling prints all day long. Um, and then we have, you know, like some kind of setup with strings hanging all over the place to put the prints up to dry. Um, okay, next one. Here's an image. Um, we, we were invited to Minneapolis and worked with the Minneapolis and St. Paul Teachers Unions, and this sort of gives you an idea of other sizes of banners and, and work we've done. Um, we had a great time. Um, we just we ended up doing four parachute banners, I think, at that one. And at one point, I walked into one of the rooms, and this father was in there with these little kids, and he was let, letting them paint on the banner. It was like a two-year-old, and they're just like pouring paint over the whole thing, you know. So working with the community can have come with some challenges, um, but it, it was kind of fun because that design was actually made by a kid, so it was kind of appropriate. It wasn't uh, one of those crazy rebel deal ones. Um, Okay, let's see. Here. Um, so this we obviously it's a kind of Rosie the Riveter image, and they took we, we asked um, the organizers in Minneapolis to take a picture of a teacher from Minneapolis, sent that to us, and then Nicholas Lankford designed this um, Rosie the Riveter um, poster that we did, art banner that we did, both Spanish and English. And we're actually going to be painting on November 2nd, 3rd. We have a mini art build planned. Um, and we're painting a parachute with that image on it as part of that. Okay. Um, then, after our build is done, we also join the, um, the community partners in the streets with the artwork. And um, that's the really, you know, the making the work is really gratifying, and that space that we're making together. Um, really powerful, but also being in the street and watching the work come, you know, bring kind of bring the fight to, to you know the people is, is amazing. And then um, we watch. Uh, that's also the thing about these is the par parachute banner, and that I'll show you in a little bit. These larger ones is that the news media can't stay away. They just you know, I mean, the striking imagery, and that was Salman's message when he came to talk to us is that. You, when you make the movement be this beautiful, you're going to get coverage on the news. Your your message is going to be brought, you know, to more people, and that's really what the arts is all about. All right. What do art builds do? So we've been thinking about this a lot. We've been working on this for a while, and started thinking about, you know, what is it that's happening as we do this stuff. Um, and as we were actually driving to Minneapolis for the NEA um, art build. We um, came up with the, this list of things as we're like going along in Nicholas's van driving down the street together. Um, so they provided creative entry points into community activist groups and their organizing efforts. As Vosas de la Frontera's executive director, Christine Newman Ortiz, put it, art builds for Vosas have added an important contribution by offering a space open to everyone to participate in the creative process. This sort of links to what I was saying before people who don't see themselves as artists. Come into these spaces and they're like, I'd like to help, but I'm not artistic. And like, it's really a paint by number. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, there's, it's a really like uh, low risk way for people who don't see themselves as artists to enter into art making for social justice. Um, and I actually have, I'll pass these around. Um, I need them back because there's not that many copies, but um, this is a, a booklet that was made. 
um, for an archive. So um, the Bosas de la Frontera art builds um, have become epic. They're just incredible. And now we've developed an archive that includes this booklet, some, a box set of posters, that original posters, um, and other ephemera from art builds. And um, Joe Brusky, who um, has provided many of the photos that are in this presentation, we call him the people's photographer. Um, he, he's everywhere. He's at every uh, movement, you know, every demonstration. He's just an incredible ally. Um, and so he has um, a set of, I think, 30 large um, photo photographic prints that are part of the archives. And now um, the Stanford has bought one. Uh, a number of universities have bought these box sets. And um, we're now opening our first bank account for art builds because we're making funds to help support the work that will um, continue to make more work. It's pretty incredible. So art builds also honor um, intersectionality of movements and build coalitions. Our builds honor a multiplicity of voices and produce work that is centered on the commons. They are intergenerational and bring diverse communities together. Um, again, Christine Newman Ortiz Bosas de los Artistas builds community by example through public art by showing that everyone can contribute in different ways their talents and abilities to our collective struggle. They create a safe space, space for engagement and action, a space for healing. Art builds nurture the soul in a time when people are hurting. One more time, I'll quote um, Christine Newman Ortiz, who is, by the way, if you ever get a chance to come to Milwaukee, you should meet her. She's about this big. And just this incredible powerhouse that is just a tireless organizer and a really a force to be reckoned with. Um, she says, the most important aspect of art in the movement is that art feeds the soul. So this part really connects to Adrian and Marie Brown's ideas and to the notion of resilience-based organizing that I mentioned earlier. The act of creating an art build space together is one that feeds the soul and stokes the fires of resistance. I can't tell you how many times we've had community members thank us, as I said, for, I mean, you know, like we're working your fingers to the bone here, and they go like, thank you so much, because having a physical artifact that you make and a physical act in a time when you feel really desperately um, worried about the situation that we're in um, has, has really proven to be this really, extremely powerful um, thing, part about being in the art field movement. So this is Jeanette Ariano, who um, is, is, I use as a way to demonstrate this fifth point that they um, invite, art builds invite artists to create art for movement. And this has been particularly potent for young artists who find an entry point into activist art through the process. Jeanette, um, we were presenting work about this, and Jeanette spoke for a bit. And she's a person who um, also struggled with depression, as I do, um, and was feeling I think pretty desperate about the situation um, when she first started coming in and making art with us. And it's really transformed her life. Um, and it's, it's a powerful statement about what this kind of work can do. Um, and she had gotten a BFA from a traditional private art school in Milwaukee, Carrie Oak School there, um, and left feeling that you know the, the idea of the art system, the kind of art world, was not something that really resonated with her, and she almost had stopped making art when she was invited to kind of take part in this, and it's just, she's on fire now, making work like crazy. She also now teaches citizenship classes for La Cecilia Frontera, and um, just, just transformed her life. It's very exciting. Okay, so as art education scholars Jody Boyd, Acuff, Sunny Spillane, and Courtney Wolfgang have said, artists have been at the crux of human rights and social justice issues in the United States for decades. Art builds give artists a home with a community of other cultural producers who share their values. And it's been pretty good for this whole part, too. I really, I, as I said, I feel like um, this work has made me feel like I want to get out of bed in the morning. Um, it's, it's, it's sustained me in a time when otherwise I would feel pretty desperate. The other thing that our builds do is they generate social media attention, which promotes upcoming actions and creates buy-in from a wide swath of community members and, cap and also captures history. So not only are we putting it out on social media, but the participants are also 
um, you know, snap a picture and sending it out. So it really, um, it, it's, it amplifies your message in a way that is pretty incredible. Um, and it's shared from a sort of a sense of, um, you know, shared ownership because people are in there painting the banners too and they want their work to be out there as well. And so it's just um, like, you know, a, a, an incredible amplification of the work. This is um, this image is one that Joe Rusky mentioned. He took he took this picture of this little boy, and then I um, designed that banner um, and we painted it with my students at Vermont's College of Fine Arts, which I teach in the summertime. Um, and then we gave it back to the school where the little boy goes to school, which is one of our field sites. And so I get to visit it now and look as it runs around underneath. Um, here is a picture of the parachute banner I mentioned earlier that they put it up on a list in the background and it ended up being right behind the video, the video capture of the um, speakers. And so that image was going out all of people were, you know, all over Twitter and it was, it was incredible high for me as an artist to be like, holy cow, you know, these people are seeing this work. Um, that's Rashad Robinson, who's the executive director of Color Change. Sean King will speak in there, like all these really rock star activists. Um, it was an incredible experience. The thing, so you see that how big that space was. We were in there while the conference was going on. It was incredible because we were in the same room. There was you know musicians and spoken word artists and all these people while we're painting away on the banners. It was it was a really a big high. All right, and finally, um, I think that's the final point of what our bills do, but maybe not. Um, Art in the streets visualizes the message, creates cohesion, attracts camera and media, and brings joy to demonstrations. According to Flood and Brendan, so these are you can see the artworks out in the streets. One more time. This is um, from the March for Our Lives that the students. So that banner that there was designed by high school students. And they have the 50 more because they walked 50 miles um, as a kind of way to generate interest about their um, the cause. And um, they were incredible young people to work with. And I just feel really lucky as part of my happiness of this work is that I'm meeting these incredible activists from all over um, who share with me their stories. And, and now I get to share with you um, one more. This one was um, a second March for Lives one where they wanted to do one for gay pride, so they had um, queer focused messages that had to do also with um, with uh, gun violence, uh, activism against gun violence. So then here's a parachute banner. One of the you know it creates joy. The parachute banner is our place. You know they're meant to be played with, and so they make a space. So they just like make a fun thing for people to do when they're at the um, when they're out in the streets. Here you can see that it was starting to rain. People eventually start going under there for shelter. Um, it's it's really um, it's just fun. It's fun to have that stuff. Um, this banner here was a hundred yard banner. It's as big as a football field. So not only does it um, you know bring media attention, but it also makes the march be that much bigger, right? Which is ten foot wide by hundred yards long. Um, and again, here it was a very hot day. This is um, for May Day. Um, it just happened to be kind of unseasonably warm in Milwaukee. And there were young people, um, children in strollers, and people in wheelchairs, and people who needed shelter, who were go walking along underneath. There's rolling along underneath the banner as people moved it along. And, I mean, it was just incredible. Um, the banner says they tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. And that was designed by Claudio Martinez, who's one of our main groups. So it's myself, Nicholas Lambert, Claudio Martinez, and um, Paul Keelan, who are the kind of main um, organizers of art builds. Anybody else can take part in it. Um, but people are starting to ship us out in different places to do this work. Uh, let's see. Where am I? Oh, so talking about um, what the what the um, art does. According to Flood and Brendan, work of this type made in art builds can be thought of as disobedient objects, which have a history as long as social struggle itself. Ordinary people have always used them to exert counter power, and object making has long been part of social movement cultures alongside music and performance. And, you know, a banner that's 100 yards long is as big as a football field. 
that is a pretty big, this would be an object. Very exciting. All right. So finally, um, now this is the last point. Uh, Arab Bell's contribute to the movement imaginary. That's again, Yates and Key's idea. This is Arab is phrasing of this idea. Um, and I really love it. Um, Maxine Green is one of my favorite philosophers, and she talks about imagining other lives. <clears throat> and this idea of a movement imaginary to me is like just a beautiful poetic metaphor for what, for what happens in this work. Um, so we're not just making the images for the demonstration, but we're making a community of people, and making a shared space that's really filled with love and commitment to making the world a better place. Um, and uh, yeah, I find it to just be incredible, and I really encourage you to think about starting an art built movement here, um, because it makes a difference in your life. Um, according to a feminist scholar, Sarah Ahmed, to be part of a movement requires you to find places to gather, meeting places. A movement is also a shelter. We convene, we have a convention. A movement comes into existence to transform what is in existence. A movement needs to take place somewhere. A movement is not just or only a movement. There is something that needs to be kept still, given a place, if we are moved to transform what is. Art builds create a space for movement building to occur. Or as Adrian Murray Brown says, change is coming. What do we need to imagine? for it. In closing, since the election of our current administration, in the midst of the chaos that has ensued, activist art has been my life hope. I've been helping to create spaces where movement imagination can grow. Being among artists and community members who are making activist art and taking it to the streets seems like the only thing I can do right now to keep my head above these troubled waters. It is for me a spiritual, artistic, and research practice. Of course, our practice also builds upon the work of historical reference, such as ACT UP and the Black Panthers, to whom we are very grateful. Yates McKee articulates a vision for this work, saying that it is necessary to be closely attuned to the subjective, affective, and imaginative dimensions of the movement in their practices of communing and their creative reinvention of democracy. As I noted in my introduction, McKee um, argues for an activist stance in in uh, economic research, and I also would, would add to that artistic research. In my experience through art activism, I have come to believe with a firm conviction that we need to reach out beyond our comfort zones to lean into the sharp points, as a Buddhist teacher, Eva Chagrin, says. In these times, I believe we must push harder and expand the reach of our stories. We must proceed by loving fiercely. Moving toward a liberatory teaching and research practice that sees all oppressions and privileges linked and therefore always relevant. We must open the door to make space for all of us to join in the movement imaginary. The social imaginary that constructed the racist and isolationist call to make America great again must be transformed to one that compels us to fight for a more just world for all. For me, this is both research and a way to stay alive. She asked how, did it, how we first start funding the art builds. Um, I have been writing small grants for community engagement work for a while, and that still continues to be um, the source of funding. So, and in fact, my job has shifted from, I used to get out of, I was stuck being an administrator for a while, I really hated it. Um, so part of what I ended up doing that I loved in that job was to um, find ways to support community engagement projects throughout the school. So I work in a school that's got five departments, music, film, um, and so these, these grants um, continue to kind of underwrite, but then, as I said, we're raising some money. But that's, that's a really, it doesn't, you know, you can, you can make this work pretty cheaply, too. Like, you can ask people to bring in sheets that they're not going to use. You can use whole cost paint to make banners. I mean, most of the paint that we started out with was, um, you know, we put out a call, bring, bring your old house paint over. Um, and then you'll supplement it with other stuff. The parachute banner, so we discovered the house paint doesn't work that well. Um, it doesn't stay on with the rains. And so um, you acrylic, you know, put acrylic paint for those are really important. So then you have to make more money. But yeah, so looking for small grants um, for, from local foundations or 
partnering with institutions that, so for example, the first, um, at the first Art Build, um, members of the Milwaukee Teachers Association were there, and they got so excited about the potential for that, and they made a grant to buy supplies for the second Art Build we did, which was this one about public education. And then that led to the work at the National, because the guy from the National um, was there, and then now they pay, they actually are shipping us to, do, to other cities to do Art Build. So, once the word gets out there, other people want to support it too. Um, so you don't have to like, you know, raising money for stuff is hard. <laughs> but usually if it's a, it, like if just planting that seed in a sense, I guess that's another thing that, that, that our bill does is you know, planting that seed in people's heads about what could be a potential and then they start bringing resources to you. So I answer it as well. Yeah. I was just wondering about um, like when you do these art builds and you say you spread the word on social media so you know people just kind of like show up and obviously you don't know like at the time that it's going to be there yeah. and I'm wondering if you ever have people who maybe like aren't on the same side of the issue that you're like protesting and if so like how do you kind of create like conversations with those people I don't know just how do you approach deal with that yeah I think that's a really good that's a really good question we haven't had anybody come and be really you know, we, we haven't had any ugliness, but I, but we always know that it could happen because it's it's a public event. Um, so we haven't, we did have a person show up who um, represented himself as a journalist and we, and it was a little dicey, you know, it seemed clear that his slant on the story was not going to be um, one that would be where we're coming from. But we just sort of met it with absolute you know, positivity and love about what we're doing, and so it's hard to, that isn't to say somebody couldn't come in and be awful. We haven't had that happen yet. But we, but when that guy did come in, we just were like, you know, sort of evangelical about that work that we were doing and excited and like, you know, oh, this is so great and, you know, there's a children's area and there, you know, and we're, we're, we're like, there's always an area where you have food and, you know, it's hard to paint that as an ugly thing, right? Um, so it could, you know, it still could come up to have something more bad happen, but you just have to go forward and head anyway, I think. But that's a, that is a good question. So like, I think when that happened the first time, we hadn't talked about what we would do, and I guess we should have, you know, thought about that. Um, but we just sort of naturally. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is a community organizer, and she, um, she always says this thing, assume support. So we sort of go from that. Yeah. Kind of a logistical question about that art pieces. You did you preconceive you're this large crowd? Did you have it on a roll or something that you just pull it out and then yep. another roller on the other end scroll it up or how did you we just um, it's it's not on a we didn't roll it up on a tube. So but then and I actually it wasn't at the end, so I don't know how they rolled it back up. Um, but that you know it, it can just kind of roll and roll on itself. And it's massive. I mean, when it's rolled up, it's massive. Yeah. yeah. And at first, when they tried, when they first, people didn't understand that you wanted to have it flat like that because they're thinking they under it right like this. And so at first, they were doing this kind of awkward thing, and it's 10 feet tall, so it's dragging on the ground. And then we explained, no, you know, people on either side, and it just like blew up the sides of the demonstration. The, the bigger logistical problem was actually making it. Because we had it set up in the gallery, and um, Nicholas had this idea that we were going to suspend the wet part on thing, you know, ropes and stuff across the ceiling, and it was really being difficult. And um, I went home that night, and I'm like kind of losing sleep of how we can make this happen. I fell asleep in the middle of the night. I was like, oh, there's this hallway up on the third floor that has a really long run, right? So we lugged it up there, and it ended up being 60 feet from one end to the other, and we had already gotten through about 35 the day before, so by the time we got down to the one end, we could pull that back, and um, so yeah, the logistical challenge was really at the making of that. Um, but yeah, you kind of train people. Yeah. Are you always able to somehow either display or recycle, or what do you do when you have these giant banner and your events over? Yeah. 
That's a good question. Um, Bolsa de la Frontera has an incredible collection of, sometimes things walk, so we, have, we do a lot of signs on wooden standard parts, like one of the workstations will be a wood shop type area where they're sanding sticks and you know constructing the, we screen print on muslin, and then we build these signs on sticks that can go way up high. And so those sometimes will, people want them and they will take them home. Um, um, but they, they have a big basement and, and they're, they're the ones that we've made the most work for. And they store it all and then toss it back out again. So, uh, and then we usually make, um, you know, demonstration specific work for, it, for them also, but they have, and the MTA as well, they, they must have a big old basement and they, they keep the work. So it belongs to the community partner. We don't, we don't keep any, any of it. Um, so that's a really good. So the archive I sent around that um, I sent around that booklet. That is for the Bosis. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I'm using the. So Bosis, uh, that that work is really well documented. This organization, Bosis de la Frontera, is unbelievable. They're just like they're a monster when it comes to um, getting crowds out and you know mobilizing. And so they knew, they kind of figured out early on that it should be archived. And as I said, Joe Brusky, is, he's take, there's so many photographs by Joe Brusky, you can't even imagine how much this guy does. So all the work we've done, he has photo documented, but it's not organized. You know, the closest one is organized into an archive that now is, you know, people are buying these art, these box hats. It's pretty incredible. But the other ones, there are photographs that are living on Joe's Flickr, you know, account and things like that. And we haven't, um, that is, you know, it'd be really good work for like a grad student who wanted to um, take this on just to make some archives of like March for Our Lives, um, to make, make a kind of complete set of the work we've done for March for Our Lives, the Teachers Union stuff. Um, they have uh, images, they have the actual objects that, you know, they own, but
And so as a result of that, like we're starting that then that organization actually gives us money to support the work we're doing. So we decided that we got to become legit and make a bank account. And um, and we're gonna have a, a website finally, which we haven't done. So that it's not there yet, but I'll certainly share that with Gary once that happens. And I think it's gonna be a quick quick turnaround to get all this content. Um, and Paul Caleb's gonna do the website. So um, and we've been asked 